so it's uh it's monday march 4th nine o'clock at night if you're on the east coast like i am um it's i have my window open and it's 60 ish degrees outside um well, okay don't, don't get used to it don't right exactly it's gonna it's gonna <laughs> go back down next week we'll be back into some more um seasonal temperatures briefly um <clears throat> anyway uh Joe is going to tell us a little bit about his adventures in archiving tapes, and I can entirely uh, sympathize with him, having archived a few uh, tapes for the 1000 slash CX81. It's not as smooth going as it seems to be with the 2068. Um, I imagine, you know, other folks will have fun stuff to talk about. Paul uh found a tape in his collection that he's sending to me to archive uh it's for a product called chroma soft chroma soft chroma soft yes and and we'll we'll leave it at that for now um but so, suffice it to say it it had an interesting premise and we'll it, we'll see we'll talk a little bit about that um as well um and whatever else whatever else comes up for the evening so with that, Joe, are you ready? You can go ahead and take the screen and take the mic, Joe. There you go. Should be seeing it now, right? Yep. Uh, no. Oh, sorry. We did for a second. <laughs> uh... And we're back. Now we're back. Okay, there we go. Okay. So... <laughs> I dug up a bunch of tapes and uh, it was things that I used back in the day and I wanted to, you know, preserve them. And I, I started playing them and they were awful sounding. So I recorded them onto a computer as a WAV file, just a standard Windows machine. And I found a, a, the ZX81 tape converter program which was a JavaScript program that reads in the, the pulses and creates perfect P files. Uh, problem was, as you can see, when <laughs> I read in my way file, it didn't really give good results. There should be one program. I don't know, I'm not familiar with Zoom. Can you see my mouse? Yep, yep, mm -hmm. see you. Okay, so there should be one program here and it should start and end. But I came up with all this gibberish. This was just awful, right? Oh, it's saying that there's multiple programs. Got yeah, it says there's okay. multiple programs. Because every time it sees a, a 128, you know, byte, yeah. it, it ends the program and starts another one. So that's what all this stuff was. <laughs> nice, right? Ugh. So I Wait, looked at it a little the, bit closer. That's and... the del delimiter? What's that? 128 is the delimiter between yeah, programs? Yeah, the, the end of program delimiter. Okay. Huh. So I kind of looked at it closer using Audacity, which is a, a free utility uh, for editing sound files. And I saw all this noise here. And then you can actually see the zeros, which are four pulses and the ones which are nine pulses right so i thought well I, I can just clean this up this is noise i can run it through noise filter and it's going to clean it up and it's just going to be magical and it's just going to work right and no <laughs> so the very first thing i did was uh, uh try to get this look to look more like a square wave that, that's really what i was looking for is make it look like a square wave so i would uh normalize it and invert it to get, well, I'll jump back here. You notice a lot of the junk is down here at the bottom. So if I inverted it, um, get the junk up at the top, or I'm sorry, uh, uh, get the junk down to the bottom. Then I found a program called Rectivert, okay? Which basically chops off anything below the zero line which is where a lot of the noise was. And if you can see these extra spikes here, does that come through the- uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, the weird transition. Spikes in front of the zeros. 
the the analyst program was counting those as uh, bad bits because of that extra spike. So I wanted to get rid of those. So I rectified it and cut off the bottom half. So it kind of looked like that. So now I have the oh. data with these extra spikes. And then I went through another amplification routine. And th this was all trial and error, right? I I tried lots of different things to get this far, but I would I would amplify it and remove the DC offset to kind of push it down here. Okay. Yeah, that's gonna ask and, you the, and the reason that I want to push it down there is because the program, I figured out that the uh, analysis program was actually looking for when does the pulse transition the zero line. That's hmm. what it was actually counting. So now I just had the occasional spike to get rid of. And I amplified it again to get me more of a nice square wave, right? So I've got these pulses. And then if I zoom in, you can see where these four pulses are the zero bit. And then I had this noise. Yeah. And I was trying to figure out where that noise was coming from. And it finally dawned on me that that's actually from the tape itself, uh, where it was wound up, it bled the pulses from one layer of tape to the other. Oh. So they kind of gave me a clue as to how to clean this up, okay? So my first thought was, well, I'm just going to delete that extra pulse. But if I delete that extra pulse, then the space in between the bits is too short. So I have to actually go through a, a, an amplification, but amplify it negative 50 dB. <laughs> okay. I thought, I thought there was a zero function. If there is, is there? I can't find it. In, in Audacity, Ryan? Yeah, uh, something like edit, or I can't okay. know exactly where. I, I think it's like there. I could zero out big chunks, but not one little tiny pulse. I think I think you want to silence it is what you want to do, but right, yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, that's what I think Ryan's talking about. Yeah. Well, there's the insert silence. Uh, I'll have to look. Oh, sorry. Double click there. Anyway, if I. Uh, Amplified it negative 50 dB, it basically got rid of it, but it preserved the space space in between those two bits. Now, I just so want to make sure I understand something, Joe. So sure. you're, you'd have to do this eight times per byte, or at least the, the noise. So Well, no, the noise, program. the noise bits were here and there. So okay. I would literally look at the, the screen of probably one byte eight pulses and i would highlight the noise pulse that you typically there was like one noise pulse per byte oh yeah okay. i mean this was this was not a quick and easy way of doing it uh but it's the only way i found it to do it reliably right so i would go through it and i would just click next next or, you know uh, uh forward 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 on the uh on the scale there and anytime I saw uh, an errant pulse, I would negatively amplify it to get rid of it. And then once I had a good clean set of pulses that kind of looked like this, then I could remove the DC offset and then save it as a WAV file. Okay, so again, I, I basically remove that DC offset so that I have these good transitions over the zero line. Yeah. Okay. And then when I ran it through the tape converter, I would get something that looked very, <laughs> made me very happy to see this screen where it, it popped up and said, no, no errors. Right. But it, it, how long did this take? Uh, I have no idea. I didn't, I didn't count time. Uh, I, like I said, in an earlier meeting, I would open up the file, I would do a dozen bytes or something like that, and then I would save it and then do it again and again and again and again. 
just over a long period of time. Uh, I, I've been doing this probably for, I don't know, six months or something like that for five or six files. And this was for those uh, those programs that you sent sent me the yes. word processor yeah. and the yeah. graphics so, some thing. of the stuff that I preserved was just stuff that I did uh, like programs to compute uh, LC circuits or oh. or gain on a transistor or something like that. They were just really simple programs. Yeah. Uh, but anything commercial, I tried to save and then and post off to you for uh, preservation. Very cool. But yeah, like I said, the, the, in the beginning, there was a lot of trial and error. But once I found that Rectivert program and realized that I needed to uh, take any noise pulses and deamplify them to zero, then it went relatively easily. So um, you you have, what, probably 10 more tapes, and that'll take the rest of your life? <laughs> no, actually, uh, everything else I that I owned has already been archived, so I'm not even going to know. Very cool. Wow. Do I need more? Wow. That's crazy. I mean, it's it's a good way to, uh, if it's something you really want to save, you know, and it's got a crappy tape, then this certainly probably would help. Yeah, it yeah. was definitely like a labor of love type thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, a question. You play the tapes on standard equipment or in computer cassette uh, recorder? It, it really didn't seem to make a difference. I, uh, well, I use this. Yeah. My uh, little realistic uh, tape deck that uh, I used a long time ago. And, mm -hmm. and played that into a sound card. And then I also used a uh, more modern digital USB connected tape drive, but the WAV files were basically the same. Yeah. Oh, okay. <clears throat> Joe, were you, were you in that meeting with, um, with George uh, Grimm where he talked, that's a mini set nine, right? Mm -hmm. For me to check, yeah, were you in that meeting where he talked about going to Radio Shack and, you know, asking some sales dude there, you know, what's the best tape player for for use with a computer, and you know, he trots that thing out, and months later we have the twenty twenty. Yep. <laughs> yeah, that's basically what this is. This is the uh, the realistic version of the twenty twenty. Yeah, yeah, well, that's cool. I've had this one for a long time. <laughs> that's the affordable version. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, those mini set nines are pretty cheap on you. I mean, they're like ten bucks plus shipping. You know, nobody's getting any money for those. Where whereas a twenty twenty is ten times that. Like, yeah, hundred well, bucks. <laughs> I think I paid a buck for this at a garage sale in the yeah. eighties. So yeah, it of course needed cleaned and new belts, but it's it's been useful for uh, a variety of old computers since then. So well, and, you know, so it's. That's the interesting thing to me is I've used multiple cassette players and, uh, you know, and then I was like, well, I'm just going to bust out the 2020 and, and try it. And I have not had any problems with it, but with, you know, these other ones, like, you know, there's, I bought one from, from Walmart and I, somebody gave me one from <clears throat> ages ago. Uh, and you know, they've been problematic, but, uh, the 2020 always does the job. <clears throat> well, I'm glad that you, uh, you know, Got to share the same pain of preserving a ZX81 tape. <laughs> I, f I feel like I'm obligated to try that software that you archive now because you put so much effort <laughs> into archiving it. <laughs> well, Adam, there's a word processor. Well, that's exactly what I'm looking for on the 1000. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. 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 It, it worked well. Let's yeah, word you processor. Find a good dot matrix printer. Mm -hmm. And it, was this a piece of software that you, uh, bought or you wrote I, I no that was that was purchased okay i think it was advertised in syntax magazine i think so yeah yep. yeah a guy named craig bird yeah and i also and have this one i don't know this is the the ge oh is that for the the ti yeah, that's a good one is uh it? well it's it's for any uh it's for any computer uh i i think i 
No, I don't even remember where I got this one. I've had this one a long time as well. That was my go-to to deck. A GE computer recorder? Yep. Very cool. Yeah, you can G tell right away by the blue letter. The uh, uh, Yeah. Very well. Kind of, yeah. 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 So, uh, there we go. It's a little bit clearer. Well, I, I know GE... GE also makes a version of the Mini Set 9 because I, oh. I don't know, a couple of years ago, I, I kind of went on the Mini Set 9 buying spree. So I kind of wanted to see, uh, you know, I did a little research of other ones that were basically the same, you know, manufacturer maybe or the guts were the same. And so there's a General Electric makes a version of it. It's kind of higher end. Um, so you'll, when you find those on, on eBay, they're a little bit more money, but it's a little bit better of a cassette deck. Uh, there's also the Mini Set 10 and the Mini Set 11, which are in the same vein as the 9. Uh, I think the 10 is actually kind of like a little of a boombox kind of thing. Um, but I think it uses the same mechanism as the 9. Mm -hmm. And the 11 uh, actually has um, separate volume controls for the left and the right. So instead of just one volume control, like on the Mini Set 9, right, you can actually, um, you know, change the left volume uh, separately from the right volume. I mean, they kind of are right next to each other. So if you hold your finger over them, you know, you can move them together. But um, if you cer certainly wanted to take one of the channels out, uh, you know, the, the 11, I think, is do that. But the 11 is kind of rare. You don't find that very often um, because I think it was also kind of more of a profession, maybe a more professional one because it actually has uh, quarter inch mic jacks to go into it to record things. Um, so whereas most of the other ones, you know, they just use the little eighth inch, right? The eighth inch ones, not the quarter inch. So anyway, Carl, maybe you can, I'm sure uh, other people here who have experience with these from back in the eighties will know better than me. So I remember always, um, reading back cause I didn't use tape players in the, in the eighties. I went straight through a disc drive. Um, but you always were supposed to try to get one that had a tone control. And I do notice if you make adjustments to the tone, it makes a difference, but what, what is that doing? I use flat the head alignment. I use flat, flat the uh, standard control, not add a uh, bass or any additional <clears throat> equalization because you distortion the the signal. If you well, I mean you can there. it. I think it's pretty easy to see what it does. I mean, if you listen to it right, and you turn you adjust the tone control, it, it you know yeah. the, when the tone controls down, it's kind of yeah. really dull, right? It's yeah. dull sounding. Right. So, filter. right. So when you turn the tone control up, it's very sharp. You know, the, the, the sound is really uh, screeching, right. As opposed to when the tone controls kind of turned way down, it's kind of like muddled. And it, so. It, I'm sorry. No, it's more affecting the, the heat alignment than the tone control. If you have the heat alignment working perfect. And the recommendation is to use a signal tape or test tape to align the, the heat. Also, if you have a stereo head, you need to put in phase both channel to read the, the mono mono tapes. Yeah, so I mean, as far as tone control, it's just, it's basically just a, a, a filter. Yeah. Right, so, um, and yeah, so azimuth, if you're talking about head alignment and things like that, those are those are mechanical things that you have to do, your, you know, you'd have to, you know, put a so screwdriver on the azimuth. Yeah. Right, right, and you'd have to get a test tape and run like a three kilohertz or 3.15 and then you get your wow and flutter and all kinds of things, you know, but that's <laughs> way out of the scope of, uh, you know, I mean, if you're that, if the tape decks that bad, it's probably just cheaper to get one of these mini set nines on eBay for 10 bucks, you know, <laughs> cause that's as close to a 2020, um, you know, I think yeah. that you can get, I mean, there's some little minute differences. They're not exactly, you know, exact copies of each other, but you know, they're definitely certainly looks like, uh, you know, they Timex might have done a few little tweaks here and there to it, but um, but I have found that it's not an identical, you know, if you because I have a 2020 and I have a mini set nine, and you take them apart, you look at them, they're not identical, so oh. but they're close, they're close, they're pretty damn close. <laughs> Carl, <clears throat> when you get a, a moment, can you uh post the model number for the GE to the email group because you've piqued my curiosity about that. Okay, yeah, yeah, because be cool. I got a, I probably got about ten mini set nines and 
yeah, I think I might have two or three 2020s. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's some other ones too. Like I said, the mini set 10, I got one or two of those, the 11s. And then there's, oh, there's another one. But yeah, the GE one's definitely more fancy. It's, uh, you know, the case is better. Cool. I think the one I have, it actually comes in a um, carrying, you know, leatherette. You put it inside a leatherette case and you oh, carry see, it on your shoulder. That's, that's the kind of accessories I need for my uh, tape archiving <laughs> experiences. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah I'll, I'll i'll dig that out and put that on the on the groups io cool no for, for the storage i use a three head deck system for high five and two computers that is for master storage and then when i save uh, in tape also i reproduce with the third head in playback in another Timex computer and see if fail or not. Depend of the tape. Many times you have a, a hole in the tape or or any any tape problem, and then when you save, you never get the the block lowered again because if the tape is not perfect, you have a problem mm -hmm. with reproduce that. It's not a a, a signal issue but it's only a tape issue yeah yeah so if you find if you find those computer tapes on ebay you know maybe you might be, want to get a few of those if you're into backing stuff up to tape probably most no. people aren't really into that but no i use a tdk or or well, I'm, I'm, right yeah. but i'm just saying you know you when you kind of get a computer cassette it's probably a better quality tape that they're using in there right as opposed to uh you know a, a 99 dollar a 99 cent cassette tape that you'd find at Walgreens back then. You know, it's a cheap tape. <laughs> no, but the problem with the with the cassette tape is is the oxid. The normal you need to clean the head or, or the or the rolls in every time you play a cassette. In, in case you use a scotch or 3M or another brand and work perfectly or TDK or, or whatever. Right. Well it's because yeah they use better tape stock and the oxides won't flake off actually the tape mechanisms you know the cassette shells right are yes. better quality mm -hmm. because like i said those cheap tapes they don't really have that you know they're mass produced you know injection molded tape cases that they probably just push together so they don't have you know uh anti uh if you take a tdk apart for instance you know it actually has real screws Real yeah, metal I mean, screws that hold the case those together. Little slips of plastic in them. Exactly, they were uh, like low, um, low friction uh, something or other. Right, exactly. That so that they wouldn't, um, you know, drag the tape down if that kind of would get stuck. Because some cheap, cheap tapes, if you'd use tapes back in the day, like probably me and Dave and some of the other guys, you know, Walkmans, you know, and things like that, where uh, you could hear the tape Squeaking. itself. Yes, yeah, you know, and it was something within the. Uh, cassette housing itself that was causing that problem. Now imagine that recording and computer stuff on there and that vibration may make it into your recording too. You know, maybe it's vibrating the mechanism or you know, certainly I'd vibrating the cassette shell, right? So there's, there's, you know, it's just like anything in life. There's, there's bottom of the barrel stuff and there's stuff that's just way over the top, but you know, it depends on how deep your pockets are, where you want to end up in that. Yeah. Hey, Paul. Yes. Are you there? I am. <laughs> <clears throat> so, Paul, uh, you found this tape in your house, your your house of, of, of collectibles. <clears throat> um, and it was, uh, it purported to somehow produce color from a 1000. Did you actually use this? So first of all, it's it's called Chromosoft, right? Correct. And and it came from um, G Russell Electronics. I don't remember off the top of my head who actually programmed it. Bill Russell. <clears throat> was it was it Bill Russell that did it? Okay. Um, well, he got the copyright anyway. Okay. So, did you actually use it back? You know, in the days I played with it. And and what happened? I was able to see three or four colors. Really? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and 
you know, I've read some of the documentation. I actually read there's a review or two of it, I think. I'm just looking. Oh, yeah, there's like three reviews of it. Um talking about how this through whatever magic sort of means would generate color on a was it a black and white screen, right? Correct, on a black and white screen. Okay. And did you have to do anything special? Just run the program. Just run the program. And would it like flicker? Would it do? Uh, uh... It oscillated the images that you were supposed to pay attention to at a certain rate that matched basically the color angstrom, which fooled the brain into seeing the color. Okay. Got it. It, it replicates, in a sense, the children's toy top with the disc with the alternating black and white stripe. Yeah, yeah. And then and that would when yes. it got to the right RPM, you began to see color. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. I don't understand what the hell you're talking about. How, what well, top? I, what? I would <laughs> certainly doubt that that would work on like a modern like LCD screen, right? I mean, on CRT, certainly. You know, there's a lot of tricks I think that you can do to pull that off. But I think on a on an LCD panel, it I don't know the processing circuitry that you would feed it. It would be like, what the hell is this crap? Probably I don't know. It may work. I, I just work. I would doubt it. Yeah. Well, I imagine the LCDs of the day in the '90s, which canceled out using the data, the you know, Timex watch, the data bank. Yes. That had to be CRT only. The possibility that the LCD technology has improved enough to maybe allow that to be replicated. I don't yeah. know. But I'm just projecting that the technology in the LCD has got good enough that it might. So but I'm not sure it's so much the LCD as the processing that, you know, that the TV is going to do to the composite signal. So, yeah. Or the RF signal. I, I imagine it's RF. If it's... It was, it was RF. Yeah, right, was right. Are, are we talking about artifacting? Is that basically what we're talking about? No. So artifacting, well, Adam, when you, when you're talking about artifacting, do you mean the thing that was used to get, more colors on an apple too like yeah, that orange colors. and that blue okay yeah that's that's one thing no actually i, I now that um uh, paul's described it i understand what's going on it's a um persistence of vision effect um oh actually here it is it's described in the wikipedia page as a as something called a newton disc so it's a, a spinning top as paul was saying with um rotating wheels and it basically depends upon your uh how how well your eyes uh process uh flickering images and um you have seen this in other situations where you've looked at something really bright and then you look away and there's still that thing in your vision and there was a guy, uh, there was a painter, Jasper Johns, who did a very famous painting using this, where he painted the American flag, but in these really weird colors. So you would look at the painting, and then you'd look away. And, you'd see the um, right colors. You'd see the right colors, yeah. Mm -hmm. I remember that painting. I think yeah. that's just a, a negative color. Yeah, J J Jasper Johns was a negative color, but a uh, very, um, very similar effect. Okay, cool. Well... It and might... I would be interested in, you know, you say it takes a black and white TV, but, yeah. you know, black and white TV doesn't display any color. Yeah, correct. Other than other than white and black. So, I mean, on the color TV, I could see that because, yeah, you're still putting a black and white signal to it, but you can maybe fiddle around with what you're doing there. Yep. Yep. So, um... I, does it work on a black and white TV or does it have to be a color TV, but you're only putting, you know... Because I would think you need something that generates color. Difference. Oh, really? Hmm. <laughs> that just blows my mind how a black and white TV can no, create it's, color. It's because it's the color is being, thing. it's a perception thing, not an yep. yeah. output thing. Okay. Yeah, it's still a black and white. It's just oscillating at the correct speed that the brain sees the color. Wow. Yeah, we're making up the colors. Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, white is all the colors, to be honest. So <laughs> when you look or at no it that way, pigments. Yep, right, right. Well, yeah. 
in an additive system, it's all in subtractive. It's none. Yeah, right. But that'd be interesting to to see if it works on. I don't know if it would work on LCDs, but maybe it might. I mean, given that yeah. the LCD, you know, certainly has the frequency bandwidth to do it, and I think that. Can't we just try this program? It's been archived now, right? Like we're talking no, no, about uh, like it's... no, it hasn't been. Paul Paul has got a oh. copy. He's going to send it to me. And oh, I um, see. yeah, let me just double check. But I don't think. And so, even if it does work, there's no way to ever take a picture of it, is there? No. <sighs> that sucks. No, you'd have to. You'd have to. <laughs> you'd have to take a picture. Record eyeball. a movie clip from it <laughs> and slow that down, you, maybe. You could yeah. probably program a thing to simulate what the brain would see. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Well, yeah. if the tape's too difficult to archive, David, you know, I'm sure Joe could probably take a whack at it. That is exactly <laughs> what I was thinking is that, you know, I'll just pass it along to Joe. <laughs> you know, experience counts for something there. That, but Joe is the local expert now. Yeah. In a few months, you'll get it back. It will be just perfect. <laughs> uh, first fight will be done. Are you well, using keyboard shortcuts in that program? And, oh yeah, oh yeah. Right. <laughs> okay, because I use its predecessor, uh, Cool Edit Pro. Mm -hmm. I remember Cool Edit. What? And it's easy to edit in that. You can expand the uh, time frame or, or shrink the time frame displayed on the screen, and it really lets you hone right in on some of those boo boos. And yeah. you've got me curious here too, Paul. What, what's the story with your background there? Oh no! I know your play on words. You like to play on words, even in your <laughs> in your <laughs> posts. Uh, but uh, that looks like a a rather strange twenty sixty eight there. Uh, it can be yours if you want it. <laughs> it's for sale. Oh boy! All right, Paul, I'm going to spotlight you just for As one sec is. here. So there's Let two eproms. Yep, yeah, two eproms and a dead bug, as it were. Uh. What's the, what's the, what is that? I can't make out. There's not enough resolution. What's the chip that's in the middle that's added on top? Well, up up at the top of the screen in the center, I believe that's a different uh, video output. Oh, okay. yeah. Yeah. That's an RCA jack with a toggle switch up there. Yep. Yeah. But... And there's two EPROMs in it instead of ROMs. Yeah. But and Paul, I don't down. remember what, why. I may have okay. picked it up somewhere instead of actually done all of that. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I mean, there's there's more flying wires on this than I've seen on a lot of things. I wonder what oh. that uh, extra chip is for. Weird. All it needs are the two bolts on its neck, and you're ready to go. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> and a jump start. <laughs> yeah. What well, I mean, earth? at the very least, it would be certainly useful for parts. I, I assume it doesn't work. I don't know. I don't have the top for that one. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Well, uh, how much are you asking for, Paul? Well, you think 50 bucks is fair? Uh, do I, personally? I mean, no. I'm not going to spend 50 bucks on it. <laughs> but somebody else might. <laughs> I don't know. It's just, you know... I mean, you know, it depends on uh, depends on what's in those ROMs, you know. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> well, gentlemen, I'm going to open the floor and uh, ask for if anybody has anything they want to talk about in particular. Well, wait, Any before we open the floor, wasn't oh. Carl supposed to give a talk? Oh, was I? Oh goodness! I, I you oh, were, but I don't know what the hell it even was about. So we'll oh, skip that. For, you know what the problem time. is? Carl has done so much that <laughs> it could be any number of things, and we've lost okay. track. What's your, well, what do you I, want I, me to? Oh, you know well, what? I know Carl, lately, let's. I let's know talk, lately. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, I was gonna say, let's talk about your uh, your fifteen ten, you know, your success with that. Yeah, Just so I was going to kind of yeah, I was going to kind of bring that up as uh, you know, we got a couple of folks on here. Well, I don't know. Uh, uh, where's um, Johnny Red? I don't see him in here. Oh, there you are. Yeah, God yes. dang, he's right there in the middle. But uh, he's interested in one, and there's obviously a, you know several other guys that I have. I, I got to get Johnny a quote uh, for shipping. Uh, looks like it's. Uh, I think I already might be sent that to you. I think because I'm, I'm. It's ringing a bell to my 
because it's almost like Canada. Because there's a yeah. guy in Canada that was looking at it, and I he kind of might even want him to, to talk to you, David, about you know I guess the harmonization codes, right? Uh, that you got to yes. put on that crap to get it. <laughs> I'll send you an email about harmonization uh, codes. And I I made it. I found a harmonization code for like a video game cartridge thing, but I, you know that's what it is. But I, I I don't. Yeah, I don't know what they do. Do they open the package and look at it and? And who the hell at the post office is going to say, oh, yeah, that's a cartridge player. Of course. Of course it is. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> you know, they're not going to know what the hell that is. You know, it's just going to be a couple of PC boards with parts on it, you know, as far as they're concerned. Um, but, but, yeah, I guess he was having problems getting it to Canada, right? Hit the stuff that you were sending it. Well, I ship stuff to Canada. I use Pirate Ship, and it looked up those codes for me. And as far as I know, no one had a problem. Other okay. Than when I ship the uh, UPS, there was an additional charge on the other end in Canada, yeah. I think. Yeah. I was like, wait, yeah, I paid full price. Why is there an additional charge on the right. other end? Uh, don't, don't know, but uh, the, yeah. So I think maybe UPS, U, uh, U.S. Postal they, Service might be the best. They charge yeah. you to bring it over the border. You, yeah. UPS charges you to bring it over the border. Oh, <laughs> but you think they would charge the sender, not the recipient? <laughs> Well, it's kind of um, like um, uh, income. taxes and levies and, you know, that kind of thing, I guess, for other countries, you know. Yeah. And, you know, I, I'm kind of like, to me, it's like, it's just Canada. But, you know, it's still, yeah, it is another country. I get that. But it's just like, come on, guys. <laughs> yeah. Now, I mean, Portugal, you know, Portugal is almost the same as Canada, really, as far <laughs> as, the price. you know, it's about 17 bucks for the U.S. Postal Service to send it there. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, you, I'm sure you got that, Johnny. And I, I haven't looked at my mails yesterday and today on that, but uh, and I was supposed to try and get some of those fifteen tens out to people today, but uh, just work was was well. Mondays can be that way, right? Mondays can be dead, or usually they're kind of busy because everybody's had the weekend to him and haw, and then Monday to oh yeah, now I'm ready to pound you with everything that I wanted to ask you on Thursday and Friday, but I'll. Saving it for Monday. Um, anyway, uh, but yeah, so there's been quite a few. I want to say at least 10, 12 people uh, yeah. that have, uh, you know, PM'd me, you know, directly about that. So, like I said, I do have 25 boards, and then I actually found another set of 10 boards from PCB Way, ironically. So maybe I bought those first. I don't know. And that's how I got onto P JLC PCB being cheaper. Cause that's kind of why I don't do PCB way much because they're more expensive than JLC PCB. Right. So, um, I know that, uh, so those aren't gold plated. Those are just the regular, you know, silver, but you know, so I, I do have quite a few, um, boards. So I think everybody will be able to get one. I, I have been noticing people getting extra cartridges, right. With their orders instead of just the one set. They'll get a set, right, which is the interface and a cartridge, and then they'll get like an extra cartridge. Um, uh, the other thing, too, there is um, since we figured out how to do 16K uh, programs, right, I changed the chip to the 512 chip, right, to the 64K by 8 um, instead of what it was originally set up for, which was the 32K chip, right, you know, the, the 256, the... 27C256. So I only had a few 512s. So I'd actually order, I ordered <laughs> like 20 of them and I got those in. They're sitting right here. So now that I've got the flash chips, now I can, you know, finish. And I've just kind of been building some, you know, a couple every day or every other day just so I can get some stock built up for when these chips came in and then I can program. And that's kind of brings me to another point where I have been. <clears throat> looking at converting some other programs like uh i know adam mentioned crazy kong uh and i guess you guys were on some kind of donkey kong kick with uh, Correct, the atari yeah. maybe or something like that uh, yeah. yeah i was playing um a, a game that was uh on the uh astrocade called monkey jump that was programmed in like uh 1.8k and i was wondering if there were any games um for right. the um, 1000 i was actually really surprised that there's not that much software for the plain jane 1000 without a 16k upgrade or at least as far as games or maybe i'm mistaken so car uh, adam um now that you mentioned this uh, th this reminds me why uh for this the zx81 the way um 
the way that the memory works if you have 1k versus 16k is is um if you have if you have 1k of of ram and you've got like a program listing it doesn't use memory for the full screen it just uses you know as much as required is to show a line but if you ended up um you know doing something that built a full screen it would use i think that's like 702 bytes right right out of the full 1k which would leave you with not much 300 bytes of you know and you subtract out a little bit for you know some of the basic overhead that's not enough to do a lot of things but there was a 1k uh you know there's multiple implementations of chess in 1k uh machine code implementations um, well the other thing too david is i know there was a lot of high res games in 1k yeah they made, uh, they made quite a few hrg games for 1k did they 2k yeah okay okay um and so, you know, 2K is not ubiquitous in the UK. No. I see. I see. And that's where most of the, you know, 81 software came from up until, up until you know, the Americans took over. <laughs> so I wouldn't, I, you know, I wouldn't say there's not a lot of games for 1K. I'm, I'm sure there's probably quite a few, but um, at least over here, probably not, right? Because yeah. they, you know, Timex was... Uh, looking at those better programs for this, you know, that use 16 K plus they got to sell a bunch of 16 K Ram packs. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And uh, introduce everybody to the infamous, you know, Ram pack wobble. But the, does Adam, doesn't the Astro Astro Kate have Kate? sort of the same problem, but with a little bit more memory uh, I'm screen not... memory and program memory of the, are um, not, not in the same way. Uh, first of all, there was there. Uh, if you had like the rich, the basics that were made for the Astro Kate, you could add all the RAM you want. You could never use it except mm -hmm. for like strings and that was it. So they actually wrote an improved basic. So if you had more RAM, you would just use the new basic. And so any programs that were written for the new basic took full advantage of more colors and things like that. So it's kind of a different story okay. there. Okay. So getting back to that, you know, like I said, so he, I think the David, you mentioned there's crazy Kong and there's like, I think Kong's revenge. I think so. Yeah. Um, yeah so I downloaded I under, the, uh, emulation. Yeah. So I downloaded them onto P files, and you know, Paul Farr was saying, "Well, you need to use emulation." So okay, I downloaded his eighty one emulator. I threw it in the emulator, and you know, in the email that he sent me, we kind of talked about how to convert a program into a cartridge, right, for the fifteen ten. Yeah. And so I tried it with uh, Crazy Kong, and actually, when you load Crazy Kong up in the emulator. It's not even 8K. It's almost, it's like 7.3K hmm. of program. So it's actually, that's kind of a small program, right, uh, mm -hmm. Adam? It's not 16K. It's, uh, oh, it'll it's actually fit in 8K. It's too big still, but you know. Well, yeah, right, <laughs> right. But it's, um, it will fit on an 8K cartridge, right? With one chip if we were to put it on a 1510. Oh, I see what you're saying. Right. So I converted it kind of the way we talked about, the you know, Paul talked about in the disassembly. And uh, I'm pretty sure, you know, some things with Ryan that we were discussing, uh, I, I got it to work. I'm pretty sure. I'm 99% sure. But then we were talking, I was talking with Adam or uh, Ryan with about some things. And I was like, well, I'm, now you're making me second guess it. So I got to try it back again. But I'm pretty sure it worked. Because um, I, I was trying to do the same thing with Kong's Revenge. And apparently Kong's Revenge is all basic. <laughs> yeah. And it's, Very slow. And, it, and, Very and, it's slow. Sick, and it's 13... 0.5 or 13.7 K of basic. Oof. So this thing is huge. This program is huge. So obviously it's not going to fit on one chip. It needs to be a 16 K program. I tried to convert that one, but I think that one has some idiosyncrasies in it where maybe it's storing some variables that it needs. That's with the program because on Kong's revenge, when I noticed or a uh, crazy Kong at the end of the program, there's like, it. that's it. The end of the basic program is the end of the, you know, there's no more code after it, uh, not necessarily code, but data, right? On on Kong's Revenge, I noticed there's this data, you know, it's fairly uh, similar data, you know, it has the same mm -hmm. things in there, but it's after the program listing yeah. has ended. That makes right? sense. And the, right, so maybe it's a display file thing or anyway, so Carl, I tried to, yeah. Carl, is that, is that, are you talking about in the P file or right. in the ROM? 
I think it's the P file. Yeah, and the Although P file, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be program, display file, and variables. Yep. Right. So I don't know why, you know, like I said, I don't know why it worked for Crazy Kong. And it, well, there's some other idiosyncrasies, like I said. So the auto start line number is 9,999. 9, yeah. Which is the highest you could put, right? Yep. And uh, I, I think that's tripping up the, the cartridge circuitry because I, I can never get the program even transferred into memory properly. It just doesn't seem to, you know, uh, some of it gets in there, but then I've got a 14, uh, a line number 14, which is a rim with a bunch of garbage in it. And then you can start seeing other line numbers hmm. that are lower after that. So it's a corrupted basic file. Um, and I, I kind of pounded my head on that for a few hours and I just said, well, you know, I, I got to move on to other things. <laughs> it's not working. And, um, so that one's, that one's kind of a, going to be a, a good nut to crack is what I'm saying. If we can get that one working, uh, cause that's kind of leads me into the next thing that Ryan's kind of doing. And I know I had talked to Paul about it, but, um, uh, let me, I haven't let me. talked to Paul back about it. Go ahead. Did you get a uh, flight simulator to work? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Okay, so because um, Mark Klusterman mm -hmm. um, commented on on you know uh, the pre the the meeting where we talked about that, and he said you know he thought that that was a twenty four k image, and I was like I was like no, I'm pretty sure that's sixteen k. No, because it's just a it's just a copy of the tape, right? Basically, okay. it's a sixteen k tape. Okay. Right. Unless there's another flight simulation program out there from somebody else that might have been bigger, but I don't know how you would, uh, you know, where's the RAM for that extra? Yeah. <laughs> right? right, right. I mean, you only you only have 16k, and not even all of that's available to you, right? Because it's used for other things, you know, yeah. the screen and 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 variables and things like that. So I don't know how much you really have. Maybe you've got. Uh, obviously you've probably got maybe 14, 15 K free yep. for programs. Yep. Cause some of these are pushing that, like I said, even flight simulations, like 13.4 K of code uh, that it transfers over. So, you know, that's up there. Yeah. Right. But if you had a 24 K cartridge, how, where is it going to put it? Unless it uses that extra code, maybe for. It's going to put it in the cloud, Carl. It's put it in the cloud. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Stream it. Yeah, yeah. The only thing there is, I think maybe if it was like static data, it could get to for things. Maybe like screen grabs, or you know, so it could it could load screens quick mm -hmm. um, and fill the screen up with uh, things. Because but then you'd have to have machine code in the cartridge that supported that, right? Because you yeah. you'd have to write that with uh, that extra eight K in mind that you would have available to you. But yeah, yeah, good point. Okay. So anyway, so back to, your, back to your adventures with uh, with uh, Ryan. Right. So Ryan's working on a program that will take a P file, right, and convert it into a ROM file, basically into a cartridge file. Nice. Uh, basically on its own. Yeah. So um, that we can kind of expand the cartridge. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, apparently there's some interest in it. I'm not saying it's like a lot, but you know, it's it does seem like there's a lot of people out there that are interested in you know, cartridges for the 1000 because, you know, Timex kind of came out with it. We moved on and it's just kind of sat there, you know, in, in that state for this for 40 years. And here we are making new cartridges <laughs> with this clone device, right, for for a 40 year old machine. Um, but yeah, it's I mean, cool. You know, there's, there's folks who, you know, like playing with their 1000. I certainly do. Um, you know, and at least ten or twelve of them have reached out to you, uh, right? You know, certainly there's there's some kind of demand. You should, you know, you should make them widely available in some way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I plan on it, but you know, okay, cool. we'll get these out to these guys, and we'll, you know, I don't think there's any bugs really to work out, other than the fact of converting programs to a cartridge file. We got to figure yeah. out, um, but as far as the hardware and all that, I think that's pretty much done. Um, I mean, it's just basically a copy of what Timex did, right? So there's nothing really new there, but um, 
Uh, it's just figuring out how to combine them for the 1510 clone, right? Because we, we, we don't really want to do it the way that Timex did it with two separate chips, right? That's just kind of yeah. wasteful and it would take a, you know more real estate on the PCB. Let's just make one big chip, throw everything in that and figure out how to decode it so that, you know, which we've done. So, um, um, but yeah, I think a lot of, you know, I have had comments about flight simulator or flight simulation. I keep calling it flight simulator, but I think the program is actually really flight simulation. Um, and some people like flight simulator programs. So uh, right. it would just make it easier if you're going to play it on real hardware, right, to, to load it because that's a long program to load. <laughs> <laughs> right. So if you had it on a cartridge, and I think that maybe is where some of this interest is coming from is because, you know, these long programs that would take six minutes to load and then, you know, oh, you had a little bug in it or a little pop here and then, oh, you failed. So there's mm -hmm. six minutes of your life you'll never get back. Uh, whereas a cartridge, you know, you throw it in and, you know, 15 seconds later, you're up and running every time. So, yeah, you know, those, those six minutes, they weren't so valuable when you were 14, but now it's like... <laughs> I might be dead in six minutes. I, don't I know. might be dead in six minutes. Yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> it certainly feels like, it feels like it waiting for this tape to load. <laughs> so, you know, there's, um, and like I said, I've been using it with my 1500 clone that's in the 1000 case. So uh, another thing kind of brought up with Ryan is I haven't actually used it on a 1000. I don't see that there'll be any problem, but, you know, because it auto runs on mine. Right. Because yes. I got the 1500 ROM in this thing. But I probably should try a few of these out on a 1000 where, you know, all you guys that are getting them uh, are going to have to type the randomized user, you know, 8192 to get it to start. And I, I mean, there's all, already one. I can't remember the guy's name that got one already. He actually got some kits. You know, I didn't even build them all. I just sent him the parts, and he built one right away, I guess. And uh, and he said it worked fine. Yeah, he posted so, to the group. Right, right. Yeah, I kind of mentioned, you know, hey, we'll post to the group to let people know that you got it and that you, you know, it works for you. And uh, um, and I programmed, you know, I programmed the stuff on his chips. He didn't do that, but I mean, he had to build the the PCBs and stuff like that, but I guess he just looked at the pictures that I posted because I was kind of worried about that. You never know people's level of skill, yep. right, with building things like that. <clears throat> so um, anyway, um, so that's kind of where we're at with that. We're just, you know, now we're starting to get some more. Since I got these chips, I can send more of these out to you guys. Uh, I need to follow up with some more. Like I said, with Johnny Red, you know, we've got these folks that are outside of the country, outside of the U.S., um, that I hope to get some of these two as well, that, you know, we don't really have any problems with the postal service getting them to you guys. Um, yeah. And, you know, I, I mean, I don't want to take any credit for all it. Like I said, it's really a super flow design, right? He just basically copied the Timex 1510, the real thing, right? So the only thing I really kind of did was, you know, figure out how to combine the chips. Well, with even with Superflow's design, the 16K cartridges wouldn't work, right? So flight simulator, flight simulation. Yeah, you said, there was, you said there was a bug in the wiring. Right. It would not work even on his. Um, and that's design. probably why we never had a, a flight simulation dump for, for that whole time until Paul Farrow, uh, you know, or the other guy was on here last time. Mark. Was, <laughs> yeah, was saying that he wanted flight simulation to work in 81. Yeah. Um, so that's quite kind of triggered paul to do that but um and then like i said i bought these boards back in early 21 you know so they've been sit or no but 22 maybe so they've been sitting around at least two years right you, you, that you I were about one year away from that being e-waste <laughs> <laughs> wait, 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 wait jeff what's the rule on that <laughs> five years not two but oh, okay yeah yeah <laughs> But, you know, and I had the 1510 cartridge players. Like I said, I bought the one in the box for like 300, 350 bucks, you know, oh a God. couple of years ago that, you know, like Anna mentioned last time that we he took video of that, you know, we got that up on the, and I never even used them. I just, you know, obviously wanted to have it, yeah. but I, I never hooked them up and used it. <laughs> I don't think I had cartridges at that time. Oh, Carl, that reminds me, have you used your Chroma 80? I have not. So that's another thing I'll talk about here just briefly, but um you have it nearby uh, you can show it to us yeah yeah 
Oh, now this creates color, but it doesn't. It doesn't do it through optical illusion. <laughs> right. Well, and it's got the cartridge. You know, he's got. He makes these little cartridges that that plug into it, so you can put, uh, you know, stuff on the cartridge. I haven't what, figured that and, out. And what's exactly. the case in the in the cartridge? Are those like three D printed or something? Yeah, they're all. This is three D printed from him. Okay. This kind of actually looks. Uh, actually, I took it apart. It's like a Hammond case. He just. It's a off the shelf. Okay. An injection molded case for the cartridge. Okay. Um, and he just obviously cut out a little piece on the bottom for the board to come through. But this is all 3D printed, yeah. This, um, and, and you know, you can go to his site and he shows the inside and everything. So it's got an RS-232 port on it for serial communication. It's got a joystick port on it uh, for, you know, if you want to play games with joysticks. Or, no, yeah. But this is for the the, the ZX-80? This, or is, the... this is for the 80, right. That's oh, because that's why the case is white? Right. Okay. Right. And it's got a, it's obviously, since he's in the UK, it's got a SCART connector. But this yeah, is right, SCART. That. Yeah, this is SCART RGB. Okay. So, uh, mm -hmm. you know, anything that you hook up to, because it has no compo no composite or S-video output, because that, that's also on the SCART connector, it can be. Yeah. Uh, but or he says, yeah, none of that. What's that? Uh, but, but uh, so yeah, this is... Um, RGB actually goes with this, so you need to have a you know a video converter that actually takes SCART RGB. A lot of them just take the, comp the composite, right, and yeah. convert it. Of course, on the back you've got a you know expansion port to connect more stuff to it. And, and then um, go ahead. Um, so you know, I read I read this once and didn't really pay too close attention. How does it create the color? So there's a you know kind of like Jeff was doing, there's an FPGA inside of there. Okay. And um, so you basically, you know, the problem with me having this is kind of putting the cart before the horse, right? <laughs> I don't have a ZX80. I never have. Um, he does make a Chroma 81 uh, because I was like, well, doesn't this just work with the 81 is what I says. Well, there's some slight differences, right? With the mm -hmm. 80 and the 81. I'm like, Obviously, there must be. Otherwise, why would you create two totally separate products, right? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so I, you know, decided. Well, I guess it's time for me to get a ZX81. Um, so you mean a ZX80? Yes. Sorry. So down here, I've been building this up. I think I posted on it on the forums. But this is, um, uh, you know, guy Wilco, two thousand nine. Yeah. Um, he came up with this. Yeah, this is just really hard to, I don't know how to, <laughs> it's your, <laughs> my shirt. No, it's your, um, zoom software. The, the, yeah, there we go. See if I'm, if I'm in the background then it, it's, like yeah. it's me, but anyway, this is a, uh, ZX 80, ZX 81 kind of hybrid machine. Um, I mean, it's mostly an 80, you know, an 80 machine um it's all discrete logic right so there's no ula on it or anything like that it obviously has a keyboard down on the bottom like the zx80 does um and i kind of went through a bunch of uh probably spent way more time on this than i wanted to but uh you know to find like the dome switches right i'm sure you've probably seen them in some cheaper things usually they have it where the they click okay. you know but there, it's just a metal dome Right, that's on there, and they used to use them in like, uh, you know, the old Mattel Electronics football. Right, calculators use them, or the the Mattel Electronics uh, games. Right, the football uh, like game. like football game where click 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 click. You know, the if you take it apart, they have these little dome switches, which are just, you know, a little piece of metal that that you know clicks and connects these two, uh, and th and this is like ten millimeters, uh, width, but it depends on what company you get it from. Mm -hmm. what they're measuring mm -hmm. so uh you can go from this corner to this corner right from the top left to the bottom left right and that's like 8.4 millimeters and <laughs> some companies that's how they measure it they measure the where the contact points are that way other companies measure it from upper right or uh, upper left corner to the lower right corner right and the, and that measurement is 10 millimeters <laughs> so some companies will measure their dome switches that way so you kind of, 
you know, and I know people have ordered some and put them on here and they were like way too small. I think they were like 7.5 millimeters or something like that. So they're way smaller. I guess it could probably still work as long as it makes the contact. Um, and then I know some people also say, well, you could just use scotch tape and I'm sure you can, right? But scotch tape for this kind of application where you're, you're, this thing's clicking and it's kind of moving. It's physically moving all the time, right? <laughs> They actually make, uh, 3M makes a specific uh, tape or adhesive that is made for those these kind of dome switches. Huh. And uh, I actually found some on Amazon. So, Carl, I can't actually see well enough. Are the dome switches on there right now? No, they're not on okay. here. I haven't, oh, I haven't really got them yet. Tell. I haven't got them yet. All you can see now is just the, yeah, I can't you see. know, it's a gold. Hmm. They're just like gold contacts on the printed circuit board. Okay. That's all. That's all they are now. Oh, if you so hold it's it closer ring. to your body, it'll be better. To, it'll be easier. It's a ring around a dot, Carl. Right. It's like a square, almost a square, but the top of the square is not there. Yes. Right. And then there's a center round contact position. And so, if you put a dome on that, it'll make that contact. Right. When you press. So that's it. what I kind of. That's what I think he intended for this, because each corner has kind of a bigger pad, right? Yeah. For that's where the feet. That's where the feet of the dome switch would would sit normally, right? And then, so on Amazon, I found, like I said, this, um, I mean, you can buy the tape in strips, which I would have probably preferred, but they, uh, somebody's gone to the trouble of making half inch round cut outs already. You know, they're half inch round. For each, for each dome? For each dome, right. Oh <laughs> well, it's, you know, that's not too bad. Um, oh, hang on, Rich. I, Let me spotlight you. Go, keep going. Um, okay. Carl. Rich is just holding so, up a real Z. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, if you look oh. at the real ZX80s, uh, they have like a spiral pattern on the PCB there. I remember. And yes. yeah. And on the, on the, on the keyboard itself, they put like little pieces of metal, right. Aluminized pieces of metal on the back. Yep. And then I think there was a, uh, a Mylar sheet or something like that, that had holes in it where each of the keys were. So when you push on a key, the, you know, the metal would go down and make the contact on the two spirals. Right. So about as cheap a keyboard as you can get. So when you're all done, Carl, <laughs> you'll be able to hook in this Chroma 80 to that. Is that the idea? Because all the signals right. will be exactly the same. Exactly. Well, okay. yeah. So this can be in a ZX80 mode um, or it can be in a ZX81 mode. And, I, you know, the ROM up here is actually another one of these 64K chips that I just got a bunch of. So it can hold uh, uh, so the... It's got a three position switch on the back, which you can't really see, but it's a red, you know, it's a red three position dip switch. Okay. Yeah. On the back there. So you can pick uh, eight different ROMs. Some of these are ZX81 ROMs. Some of them are ZX80 ROMs. Some of them are uh, your favorite Azim, what do they call it? The Azimuth, uh, Azimuth a Azimuth. assembler codes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Some of them, some of them are those uh, ROMs. So you'll be able to turn this into an assembler, you know, Z80 assembly. Platform. Wait, back up a second. So the ZX80 had separate ROMs available for it that you would replace? No, the... oh. no, no, no. Not originally. Oh. The, that's that's why this is kind of a modernized design. So he actually has a 64K chip in here that holds eight 8K okay. ROMs. But these aren't ROMs that were programmed back in the day? He These have been written since? Um, well, I mean, most of them are from the back in the day. All the ZX80 ROMs are. Well, that's the, what I'm saying. So in other words, there ROMs. were people who were making their ZX80 into just a machine language programming devices? Yes. Or my mis yes, there were. Right. Oh, okay. No, you're, you're correct. Right. The, the, it was a guy that um, wrote a, a 4K, I think it's a 4K ROM. Um, yes. Called called the ASMIC, A-S-Z-M-I-C, I believe. Um, and it has a manual. The manual is like three quarters of an inch thick. Um, and it's for developing, you know, machine language programs. And I guess you could write them off into cassette tapes in some kind of standard format that would load on a machine that didn't have that ROM. Um, that particular, well, obviously it's been preserved because, you know, Carl has it and other people have it. Uh, and the manual's up on, um, up on, on uh, archive. Now that's a machine language monitor or an assembler. That must be a monitor, right? It turns this whole Let's platform see. into a machine language tool. So you can, oh, you know, disassemble, yeah. assemble, make your own code, you know, disassemble other people's code. 
So it's not even running the Sinclair ROM. I follow it's, you. Yeah. It, right. It yeah. totally runs its own OS, hey, right? Oh. It's basically set up. Yeah. Hey, hey Paul. I'm going to mute you. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't you the like Jupiter Ron, Ace? Huh? Yeah, uh, Jupiter Ace is similar. Uh, right. I think that was like a clone of the yeah. ZX80, right? But it ran something else. Was it fourth? Fourth. Yeah. yeah fourth. There's also there's also a fourth ROM that's uh that's on here. So the, what's the third ROM? What's in the third ROM? Well, he's got a bunch of different versions of the ZX81, like Edition One, Edition Two, Edition Three. So they're like, you know, yeah. the, the different versions of the 81s ROM. But but the fourth um, one has fourth. The fourth one has fourth, right? So okay. there's one fourth. I think there's two azimuth, or well, however the hell you say yeah. that. Yeah. I think there's one for the 80 and one for the 81. And you and know, we've kind of one... talked about this. <laughs> Uh yeah oh uh, well I don't know there's eight who's, of them on there who's on first yeah so I'll probably have to drill a, I'll probably have to drill a hole on the bottom of the kit because I'm getting some 3D printed white cases you know for this so I will have to drill a hole because it doesn't have the hole there for the dip switch um so you'll you'll you guys will see the progress of this as it goes but um uh yeah so suffice it to say I have I a had... question for the group here uh. Like that's pertaining to this. Did anyone here start off on the ZX80? Silence. Anybody? Mm -mm. Oh, okay. I had a friend who had a ZX80 that he got from a one of our science teachers or something like that. Was yeah. that later or at the back then? Uh, no, it was then. It was. Um, I think. Did I? I think. I think he got it before <laughs> I got my one thousand. So. Yeah, this 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 I think you only really would see the advertisements like in newspaper no, or uh, magazines, right? Kind of like how Tim got his, I think he got his ZX81 back in the day from Sinclair, right? But they were they had these ads in the in the Ryan got his that magazines. way too, I right? Think. Exactly. Mail order, right. yeah. And so I remember the ads for this. You know, this was more expensive than the 81, obviously, because well, it's got discrete chips. <laughs> You know, how much are all those chips going to cost as opposed to throwing all that into one big, you know, ULA? Um, I mean, the sockets alone on this thing, at, at least in 2024, is, is probably a good, you know, 10, 15 bucks just for the sockets. You're buying sockets <laughs> from the wrong place. Well, I mean, yeah, but, you know. <laughs> I mean, I don't want to get the shitty cheapest sockets that I can get. You know, these are dual white, blah, blah, blah. You know, I want to make sure they're kind of, they're not <laughs> pin, they're not pin sockets. I don't want to go that far. Right. But, um, you know, they're definitely dual white. Plus there's this little expansion board. Whoop, there it goes. And what did now you, you know, broke it? Up. Oh, you know, you've done it now. Yeah. And there's this little expansion board that he makes that, uh, a couple as switches. you know, well, you, well, the video connection's right here, right? Ah, that's stupid. You know, it's, and look what's right next to the video connection. This, the expansion bus. Oh. <laughs> the Got expansion it. bus on the 80, right, is on the left side. Yeah. Not on the right side. It's on the left side, and the video connector's, like, right next to it. So if you had something you were plugging into this, you're probably going to, and it stood up a little bit, like a RAM pack, you're probably going to block your video connection, mm -hmm. right? So that's one reason he built this the expansion connector is to push it back a little bit, right? So you can actually connect something to the video port. Um, in this case, it's composite. Um, it's not RF. You don't see a modulator on here. Uh, but he also put this uh, surface mount micro or mini USB connector. And most of those are 5 volts. You've got a f switch here for on and off. So you can actually run this straight from like a USB phone charger. Oh, so it's not it's not a USB port on the ZX80. No, no, it's just using it for power, right? Come on, Dave. Yeah. <laughs> <It's> just... <laughs> um. So and then plus it brings the reset switch out because there is one on the board, but obviously when the case is on it, you're not going to be able to get to that. And then he's got the jumpers here where you can change it from ZX81 to ZX80 mode, which is also inside, <clears> but you know with the case on it again, how would you be able to change the modes? Um, although Carl, apparently, go ahead. Oh, I was going to ask you, um, you have a couple of these, right? Yeah. So I got, well, obviously you have to get five boards. Yep. <laughs> so I have five of these. Uh, of course I don't, this is the only one I'm building up right now, but I bought enough parts. You know, I bought all the parts for all five. Okay. 
right? So if anybody else is interested, and I think I kind of alluded to that on the forum, and, uh, you know, I haven't really got any bites on that yet, but I'm sure once this thing is all together and works, you know, people may be like, hey, that's kind of cool. I wouldn't mind getting – but, you know, like I said – AD... How much does an AD uh, sell for nowadays? Like oh, I said, if you get a, a crappy one, you know, like a broken crappy one, probably 300 bucks. Oh, my God. Now, if you get a nice one, probably like it's in the box and everything, you're mm -hmm. probably looking close to a thousand dollars. You know, I've seen them six to you know a thousand, six hundred to thousand dollars for a for a real ZX80, and then you're stuck with all the you know the RF video, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? And uh, you don't have this ROM switching thing. You'd have to actually you know have to burn ROMs and put them in there, right? So this is kind of a nice modernized version of the ZX80, and like I said, you can turn it into an 81. Uh, that's all made out, out of, you know, discrete parts. So it's one of those, you know, it's kind of a Harlequin thing, right, for the for the Spectrum. Carl. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the original, just as a reminder, the original 80, you could upgrade with the ROM and a keyboard yes. uh, yep. sticker. The, the only thing that didn't work was, uh, I think, uh, slow mode. Is that that's right, because right. it. Because you didn't have an NMI generator, right? There was no NMI generator is, on the original one. Is does this one fix that when you yes. put an eighty one? Okay. Yes, it has an NMI generator mode, so it. Uh, and doing some research, you know, on the eighty building this, uh, apparently, you know, just, it's, just to make it's, sure we uh, are, are, you're talking about the non maskable interrupt. Is that what you're talking about? Right. Now? Right. Okay. Just to make clear, that's how people. that's how slow mode works, where it always can display something on the screen. The original ZX80 didn't have that, so every time you type something, uh, the machine was basically running in fast mode. If you put the ZX80 in fast 81 in fast mode, so every time you hit a key, the screen would blink because it had yeah. to it had Turn to go do that right, and then it comes back and does the video. So yeah, that that's added to this. There's also you know they they pretty much made it like an 81, so it can run just like an 81 can. Um, so this will be great for when I get the Chroma 81, whenever Paul decides to make some of those, you know, then I'll be able to use this as well. But of course, you know, they'll work on the, um, the ZX81 or the 1000s and stuff like that. Yeah. So the, you know, the whole point of all of this is to kind of take advantage of what Paul has done in the Chroma product. He's also got a Spectra product, which is for the Spectrum, a uh, similar thing. Although, you know, Spectrum already has color, but I think it puts a sound chip in there. He put that kind of stuff in the FPGA, right? It's a sound chip in there. Um, you know, in the case of the 80 and 81, it's color video. Um, and he's got games and programs on his site that he has colorized, right? right? So you can either put a, it's either simple color, where it's actually just a colorization file, I guess, that you load up with the game and it colors things on the screen. Or he's gone so far as some of the programs, it's actually real-time color. He's basically rewrote the program to take advantage of color capabilities and do that within the within the programs themselves, right? And sound, right? I mean, if you want sound, joystick capability, you know, I don't know why the hell I'm even doing all of this, but... Um... Well, <laughs> you know, uh, so that you can play group, of course. whatever well, yeah. game there was for the... ZX80 in color. I think I think that there was like a Space Invaders uh for the 80 and right. that is what launched SoftSync. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. That was that was the, you know, the starter starter product for for SoftSync was that um and it was written by some person in uh, you know, Australia or New Zealand or something. Okay. Yeah. So I mean, you know, this thing kind of takes us back to the very beginning, you know, of, with all of the stuff that yeah. we have. We, I mean, we wouldn't be here if this machine never made it off the ground. Yeah. I mean, it didn't really make a big splash here in the U.S., obviously. I mean, it was pretty popular, I think, in the U.K. Um, and it obviously led to the ZX81, which we know was popular here once Timex <laughs> got their uh, yeah got their mitts into it. Um, but it's just, yeah, this keyboard thing kind of was, I was thinking, well, I'll just put a membrane keyboard on there because there are connections over here for like the five pin and the seven pin tails where you can put the keyboard tails into it. Mm -hmm. um, but I was like, well, I don't think that's how it really was originally. It really used those metal things on the keypad itself. Uh, 
so the way it was originally is that there's a spot like you said there's a spiral pattern right and then there's a metalized overlay that's mm -hmm. just flat that uh, meta not metalized um yeah metalized it's like mylar it's metal like, yeah it's yeah. metal yeah and then they had holes cut out in a mylar sheet so that it wouldn't short all the time yeah you'd actually have to push the yeah and it but would it was, push it was the terrible. metal down it was right, like the, it's right. like the the 81 or the one you know the 1000 is terrible <laughs> so if somebody wants one of your spare you know kits email you through the group somehow yeah yeah i think i've started a thread on this already okay and uh you know i've taken a picture of it kind of being built because i know adam kind of mentioned it, it that's kind of cool seeing it uh in process right yeah, instead of just cool. oh here's a finished product you know and it's done and you don't see you know how you got there you just you... <laughs> some people like to see how the sausage is made i guess right, right. <laughs> cool so um but yeah i mean the point is, is getting the boards, you know, so if you're interested in it, you know, a lot of people don't want to just buy the boards, right? They don't know how to do that. You or need all that stuff. You yeah, you don't want it stuff, right. Yeah. And then getting all the parts for it wasn't really that easy, too, because it's all old TTL yep. chips, right, which aren't uh, aren't necessarily that easy to find, and they're not necessarily that cheap anymore. <laughs> and also, how can you guarantee that they're going to work still? I mean, they're new old stock, right? Right. They're all new old stock and I got them from, you know, reputable places. You know, these aren't, these aren't coming from, the only thing really coming from China are the domes, the, okay. those metal domes, because the metal domes here, you can get them, but they're fucking expensive guys. It's like 35 cents each for a hundred. That's Carl? 35 bucks. Carl, you know, those, you know, those little <laughs> inserts that go into the, um, uh, you know, into the card edge connector that make the divider. For like, uh -huh. you, know, you know, how much those are? Those are 50 cents a pop. Yeah. 50. Anyway. Anyway, yeah. on that uh, note. Um, on that note. In a, in a few weeks, 10 days, it'll be March uh, 14th. And, you know, for some of us nerds, that's Pi Day. Uh, but before Pi Day, uh, we are in one of the unusual years where a certain sequence of numbers adds up to something even nerdier than pi and with that you're Adam, talking about bod day that's bod your day. intro yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah well hi guys uh i just wanted to take a moment to uh talk about i put, made one post about this but i didn't know about anything about this bod day until uh friday and my local friend uh brian who uh we get together for atari days and things like that he has a uh, youtube channel called ballistic coffee boy and uh, he called me up kind of frantically saying, uh, I'm doing these interviews with these two people who are sysops, who are Atari BBSs, but I, I don't know anything about it. <laughs> and I said, uh, well, what do you need? And he's like, I need you to come with me. And I was like, I don't know if I have time, but eventually we made some time. And so on Friday, we interviewed um, the BBS uh, sysop of a place called The Basement, which we've called Carl and Ryan mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. from our 2068. Uh, so I got to interview him with Brian and also another one called Southern Amos, which I wasn't familiar with that one. But apparently during this interview, um, not apparently, I did discover that there's about a thousand current BBSs still active. Um, only a few of them can you call on a phone, but most of them you can um, tell that to. And um, so on 3-12-24, which would have been back in the day, that would have been like 300, 1200, 2400 baud. So that's this coming Tuesday, so a week after tomorrow. Um, I'm having a couple of people over, and Ryan and Carl, you're invited. Mm -hmm. And we're going to uh, use an Atari, and we're going to also use the 2068 to uh, call um, some BBSs. And I also discovered that there's a, a couple of phone numbers here in the United States. Um, and I think one of them is in Buffalo, David, um, hmm. that I can call. And they have these Linux boards, so you, I can call into this computer and um, then directly tell that from there, and it'll do it'll do all the work. My my Timex or Atari won't know anything about it. It'll just call a BBS, um, hmm. which I'm going to try calling the ZX Spectrum BBS that I called the other day. Excuse, excuse me, I didn't call it, but I used um, uh, an iMac software or iOS software called Muffin Term, and um, I was able to contact the two ZX Spectrum BBSs that are running on um, Linux. So hmm. um, yeah, it's pretty hmm. interesting. There's 
it's way more active than I thought um, when I was speaking with these sysops. And by the way, there's apparently two ways to say sysop. One of them calls himself a sysop. I've never heard it called that before. That, that's unreasonable. Hey, <laughs> he's, he was one for many years, so what do I know? Huh. Huh. Yeah, I've, I've always heard it called sysop. It's yeah, me too. In my, in my uh, back in the day days. Right. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's pronounced GIF. All right. <laughs> Let's start it. Let's start that argument. Let's do it. No, so you realize, um, uh, Adam. You realize that uh, all the UK listeners will say, "Wait, we're not celebrating Bod Day till December 3rd, right?" Yes. In fact, that came up. That came up. They're going to celebrate it later this year. Um, and apparently, this is the second one. the The first one was celebrated in '96 uh, because it was um, what was it? I guess 12, 24, 96. And they just skipped oh, the three. Okay. Yeah, so right. it just takes a while, and I think the next one is celebrated in like ten thousand years or something. I don't know. <laughs> I was gonna say I don't know when the next one would be. Forty-eight. Was was yeah. it forty-eight hundred? Yeah, uh, forty-eight hundred. You know, for a little while. Oh, yeah. I don't even know that one. Yeah, Adam, well, I think... it's just a. It... Go ahead. I have something you probably need. Then it's. Uh... Oh. I just I just got <laughs> this. It's it's an unopened Hayes twenty four hundred baud modem. Well, I have a 336 bit. modem, and I, oh no, no, you need this 2400 no, yeah, go. modem right here. This is yeah, you need, that look, thing, anything look above 24. Yeah. yeah, wow, that looks like a real smart modem, actually. Yeah, it is. It is one, it isn't is. it? Yeah, it's a that, it's that unopened. Thing go, it's that it thing will go great with the uh, stuff. that thing yeah. will go great with the RS232 mod on the 1500. I mean, yeah. on the uh, 2050. Yeah, that'd be great. You know, right. honestly, isn't that um. The modems they they start the ATDT or am I mistaken? That's correct. It is right. Okay. Wow. Yeah, yeah. That's what they call them smart modems. Okay. Yeah. Well. They okay. The, Go figure. Yeah. So well, you know you know anything over twenty four hundred bonds too fast to read anyway. So. That's correct. That's what that's what I liked about three hundred. You could read it. One ten was too slow. Three hundred was good. Twelve hundred was like getting out of range. You know, and like you said, twenty four hundred was just ridiculous. <laughs> Um, yeah, during the um, the meeting that uh, we were uh, looking at the uh, one of the boards, I think it was the Southern Amos board, and I didn't realize like I was aware of um, a Tasky, which are like screen graphics that draw quote art mm -hmm. um, on the Atari, but apparently bulletin boards also had animated ASCII or a Tasky. So like on these bulletin boards at 9600 baud, there's like these animations that are going all over the screen. I was like, I'd never seen that. So. Anyone the, the the same thing uh, uh, the same thing existed for the Commodore users because okay. they had pet like Commodore Tasky, yeah yeah right okay Pesky, um, yeah and um, then later uh, the same thing existed for the DOS folks because you know DOS had this Andy. you know huge character set plus yeah. color and and this actually came up uh, somebody just posted um, in in one of the I don't remember one of the websites where I get uh, um, in my RSS feed uh, an animation from the '90s. Uh, it was like an entry screen from when you log into the into the BBS. It's just full color animation. It just like grew up from the bottom. So it built this drawing of a city and stuff like that. The, the normal is use ANSI escape codes to get ANSI. Animation yes, on the that's screen. right. Yes, the ANSI escapes. Yeah. 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 Um, so my question is, and my final thought on this entire comment here, is uh, whether or not, is there anyone here who will, because you can use um, like Muffin Term on your iPad or Sync. There's another one for Windows, and you can just log into any of these many bulletin boards. Is uh, So if you want to, um, you can do it on, on the, on the, I was going to say Pi Day. Look what you got me talking about now, David. On, on Bod Day, you can um, log into a, a BBS and Pretend it's like 1995 or something, or 1985, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> so I don't think I don't think a lot of us want to think that it's 1995 right. again. Sure enough, no, sure <laughs> no. Uh, somebody on the on the list posted a uh, schematic for um, an 8251 mapped to the same ports as the as the 2050. The 8251 is the serial chip inside the 2050 sure. modem. So basically, it was uh, it was a 2050 minus 
the modem parts, mm -hmm. uh, just turning it into an RS-232. <clears throat> and I, uh, I went and plugged that into Easy EDA and had some boards made, which I think are coming in a day or two. Yeah, I think that's the order that, that's coming. Um, <clears throat> but prior to that, uh, prior to making those boards, I ordered some, uh, let me see, is this the right screen? Yes, here we go. <clears throat> I ordered some uh, of, of these, this retro Wi-Fi modem. Because we've talked about, I, I mentioned this a little bit, you know, this, this, you can do this, right? Mm -hmm. I, the reason that I picked them is because of this. <laughs> I got the case. And yes. It I makes just got to get the little red lens. <laughs> and so my goal here is I'm going to take that 2050 uh you know that circuit that that got posted maybe two three weeks ago and uh this actually uses a um uh inside it's got a, a ribbon connector and i didn't bother with the with the db9 i just got the i'm gonna run a ribbon connector from you know one board to the other <clears throat> um and it has so the the little blue circuit in the middle is the ESP32 that does, you know, all the magic. And then the little silver thing with the, I don't know if you can see it, but there's an SD, mini SD card peeking out. That's the thing that makes the noises. <laughs> so I have enough parts, uh, you know, and whatnot to make a, a couple. So I might be able to get it online by the 12th if I can find some free time pushing this it. weekend. Be pushing it. I'm going to be pushing it. Yes. Yeah. I won't have and the red, kind of, the you know the red LED. Yeah, the the yeah the bezel. Right, right, right. Well, you probably could just. Well, I know I kind of did it for another project years ago, but just buy some plexiglass, and you'll yeah. have to cut it yourself, though. But yeah, 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 I'm sure you can. I'm sure that the one that comes with that case, because that that's an off-the-shelf case, right? It is. It's a. It looks like. A, uh, Hammond. Yeah, another Hammond case. You can yep. just pull the black one out and then make a template and there you go and cut out five or ten of them <laughs> yeah yeah so but I, you bring you were bringing that up go ahead i was just gonna say so uh my buddy brian who uh was in the interview with me or was the interviewer and i was co-interviewing he actually um called mci i think and is uh having a phone line i think it's supposed to be installed today actually oh my god so he's gonna yeah a real phone line and i was like how much is that gonna cost and he said there's some introductory deal like it's like twenty dollars a month or something. <laughs> so he's wow. gonna, you know, be able to have it for probably three months, and it'll be a hundred dollars a month. I don't know. That's just made up number, but twenty dollars a month is what he said for now. And I do remember, try. you know, as as all of us older folks do, you know, when we moved down and got on our own, we mm -hmm. and we actually got our first phone lines in mm -hmm. our own names. That was that was something, right? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> The other thing too, David, you were mentioning. I, I was looking at something else. I think they call those things kind of like a Westby, right? They're 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 because they use the. Well, I think the Westby uses a Pi. So the, so the Westby is the is motor. the little thing that you can hook up to this the ZX eighty one, and uh, it hooks it hooks into the ear line, to the video line, and to the power, and it basically. Um, will let you load uh, uh, software directly into your, you know, 81 or 1000. Um, Over Wi-Fi. Oh, but you know, so the, right, the, the cool right. thing is it's also a web server and you connect to it from right. your PC and put the stuff <laughs> on the USB and then it, you know, yeah. Right. That's kind of what I was, uh, you know, we were talking about the wire, wireless modem thing, I think last meeting. Mm -hmm. And that I was kind of, I knew what the name, it was like, that's on the tip of my tongue. And yeah, it was, it was that USB. I don't know if the Westby the, does yeah. that, but um, well, but yeah, you know, like you said, it has a web server. You can get to it from a modern machine, and you can yeah. load stuff onto your over the Wi-Fi, right? Yeah. So you can't use the ZX81 to get out to the internet, but <laughs> you can yeah. get to the to your 81 through your through your desktop well, machines. And you know what? Um, you could because um, um, Fred Nackbauer wrote a program called ZX Term 80 for the 81 slash 1000. I think you have, I think it, you have to use it in 16 K mode. Um, but it talked to the 2050 
uh, modem. And so, yeah, uh, you know, I'll build one of these things. I'll, maybe I'll build two or three of them. And one of them could be hooked up to an 81 or 1000. And, you know, you can get to the internet. And, and, and the yeah. other thing about Fred's program is that it uses high res mode to get more than 32 columns. I don't remember. It, it might be 80 columns. Let's go double check. So it can do 80 columns. That's more than the 2068 can do. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that, that'd be funny. It's like uh, it's like a three that's... pixel wide character. <laughs> well, like yeah, I said, you... Adam, go ahead. I was just saying that I saw that one. Uh, what was that one terminal I was using, Adam? That used a three by five pixel font and then oh, smashed yeah. them together. It smashed yeah. them together with no blank pixel between them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the too, Adam. As I was going to mention, is uh, you know, have a look at some of the more recent releases of games for the eighty-one or the one thousand that use okay. the high-res graphics. You'll be impressed. Yeah, the, I have the, I have a book they... that has like uh, for the ZX eighty-one. It has eighty. Of course, it doesn't have the games. I I did download them, but I haven't tried to be on. I got it semi recently. It's like eighty games for the or eighty-one games for the eighty-one. I think it's called. Yeah, I think David or, talked about it, and I bought it. Or or you yeah, thinking but... of of Johan? Johan, uh, I've got his book. Yeah, there exactly. you are. I have it. Yeah, it's not 80, here. 81 high res games for the 1K ZX81. Yeah. Johan Coleman. Right. He didn't put the listings in it. They're all on Sinclair right. ZX. You can download board. them. That's correct. Yeah. 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 And but I think um, these are, but they're not these... fancy. They're very simple, simple, simple games. Because, of course, he wrote 81 games in like a very short period of time. Right. But there's other games that are, they're not 1K games. They take much yeah. more. But okay. they use the high res graphics, like a Donkey Kong. I think there's a Donkey Kong version for the ZX81. It really? uses high res graphics, and it looks almost like the arcade game. Well, if because you can find that poster, HRG. please, I'd be I'd appreciate it. Okay, all right. Yeah. Um, speaking of high res and the 81, I'm going to give Greg Harder a plug because Greg is a person that worked with um, Fred and wrote a bunch of software. Um, they wrote a uh, they wrote a, a high res basic extension for the 81. And <clears throat> Greg is still active. Uh, he's got a YouTube channel. I'm going to just drop this in the chat. Um, he is active on the Sinclair um, ZX world forums, posting new programs that he's written. Really cool stuff. Just amazing. Um, this, this, this Mandelbrot thing that he has a video, a 10 minute video of, of his work. Um, it's worth, you know, the 10 minutes of your time and, and you don't have to wait for the thing to load. <laughs> I have it on cartridge already. So don't worry about that. <laughs> Unfortunately, Greg does not have a high speed internet connection. And so he can't, you know, he can't, he goes down to, I've talked to him through email. He goes down to his library and posts these videos, I guess, from, from his oh. library, you know, <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, he's you know, hard hardcore dude. Um, <clears throat> so, so I I have a question about that. I'm not sure. You probably don't know the details, but I know here at the Albuquerque Library System, you can just sit in the parking lot. And they have an open Wi-Fi system. <laughs> and you can be a guest, and you can just like. And they originally did it started during COVID, so that people um could use it. I don't I don't really understand why, but they did, and now it's still used. So yeah. Yeah. Um, right. Like you said, COVID. Uh, I don't know. I think Greg actually goes in and uses the library. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm just saying it's it's kind of interesting that the library has resources like that for users. Yeah. 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 Uh, we got about 20 minutes left. We've hogged up a, a lot of time. Is there? Uh, and and by the way, when I when I'm asking you guys for you know if you want to talk, and if you're raising your hand, um, I probably don't see you. So use the use the Zoom hand raising because <clears throat> for the recording purposes, I have it set so that it focuses on uh, the most recent speaker instead of you know this mosaic that a bunch of you were probably using to look at. Uh, oh, well, so. is there anyone here who's uh, new and hasn't been here before? I would uh, like to talk to them. New who hasn't been here before? Well, Rich, uh, Rich, who just dropped. Rich Sutherland was with us before, I think, but hasn't okay. been around in a long time. 
Uh, hey, Jeremiah, are you able to show that that screen that you posted to um, Facebook? Do you have that handy? Um, I can try. I've got. The, I uh, am not sure how to share my screen, but I'll give it a shot. There's a green button at the bottom of the Zoom window. Yeah, I just hit the green button. And, and then you have to you have to pick the which you know which of your many uh, windows. <laughs> That's always a challenge. Yeah, I. So so to tip. do some setup, uh, Jeremiah posted to Facebook um, a very intriguing looking screen for a game. I guess that is you're developing, uh, or was it just maybe sort of a test screen, Jeremiah? Kind of. It's a, it's a test screen. Uh, I'm trying to learn uh, uh, assembly language for the uh, 2068. Oh, cool. And and this hopefully will turn into a little bit of a game or a game engine that uh, I can do stuff with later on. Okay. Um, okay. This... Uh, I might. Oh, here we go. Let me just uh, let me just share my screen because I found it. I found it on Facebook. All right. Uh, so cool. There we go. Can I make this bigger? It looks like Dragon Warrior Dragon Quest. Really? What does that mean? What does what mean? The uh, NES Dragon Quest. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Oh, so bo both of you guys know what that is. I, I, I never played on the. Oh so. my gosh. <laughs> 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 no, but I was just caught by you know it really caught my attention. Uh, you know, you used a bunch of user defined graphics here. Um, and you know, it kind okay. So, Dragon Quest must be like some kind of uh, uh, RPG, okay. I was yeah, gonna say DD kind of game, RPG, yeah, okay. like a Japanese RPG, yeah. And okay. oh, I had the, the quick backstory to that game is that it sold so poorly that, um, in America, that they gave it away with a magazine for a subscription, and then since everybody got it, it became very well known, and the rest of the sequels sold much better. Oh, okay, yeah. okay, yeah. So, Jeremiah, are you are you going to turn this screen that we looked at into something full fledged, or is this sort of just a test uh, test run? I'm I'm working on it. I'm I'm going to turn it into like a probably a really short uh, short uh, game just to get used to it. And uh, I'm hoping because uh, this kind of game is kind of hard to to do. Uh, without like save and load features because sometimes it takes a, a a while to finish an rpg you can't really do it in one sitting yeah um so i'm hoping that uh i can put together a little bit of an engine and uh and a really short game something that you can do in one sitting and uh maybe depending on what happens with the tsp go later if there's you know loads uh you know, file I.O. features that I'll be able to access from assembler language. Um, mm. Maybe put together something bigger. Okay. Okay. Cool. Well, you have, um, you know, one of the right people here tonight, Gustavo. <laughs> Gustavo, did yes, you get that? Exactly. Cool. Well, <laughs> you, congratulations. You that. <laughs> any, any question regarding the, the assembly programming? Hello. I don't think he. I don't think he has any questions right now. But I think, but you know, maybe he has some questions on how he can use the load and save routines to load and save to the SD card from his program. Ah, okay, okay, perfect. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But regarding the the TS Pico, for example, we changed the in the and the entry point using the same entry point. Oh, really? so, as the original uh, tape routine use. And in case that you need to send a block to the SD card using the, the TS Pico, you simply use the same protocol as uh, using assembly language like use as a tape. The system automatically detect if you are using Assemble or basic command. Uh, you can gain access to the save on, on tape using uh, assemble 
and the standard entry point of the XROM addresses. You no need to modify nothing in, 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 in the assembly if using a tape or using the, the, the TS Pico storage solution. The, the, only, the only command you need to add before that is to get the info into the system, what tab file are you using to create a new one if you not have any existing on the, on the SD card. Just is the only additional TPI command you need to add uh, to the system. You can send the command from basic or for assembly. Uh, you can send the, the command for both different uh, different locations. So that could be possible. Yeah. Gustavo, it sounds like we need to um, get busy with getting some documentation up for folks like Jeremiah. <laughs> yes, no, it exists on the on the previous uh, manual uh, one year ago, maybe I wrote that with yeah. a, some example. It's internal yeah. documentation, but we can share with with the, any people that they like to, yeah. you know, to introduce I think, or to use in the low I level what, program. I think what David's alluding to is that there should just be some kind of public document that shows how to use these features so yeah. that people like Jeremiah or other developers can, you know, hey, I'd like to be able to save or read from the SD card. You know, how do I do that? It's it just, you know, not necessarily something you have to ask for, but it should no. just be a and, we, and what I'm delete, saying, Carl, is we'll, we'll put it no, up on the GitHub. Right. We, we, de we delete this uh, info because we assume that the, for, for the end user manual or info is, is too advanced. No. Uh, in, <laughs> include, uh, yeah, because inside the ROM, you have a small BIOS in order to, to send the low level routines. When, when I de develop the system, I introduce many, many input points to be more easy, the, the assembly programming. But it's yeah. not published that we can publish it. It's not a problem for the 2068 programmers. Yeah, right. That's only to avoid the confusion with the with the normal user or with the basic users. Okay, yeah, to, to, to your point, Carl, we have a bunch of information that we need to put up in, um, <clears throat> up in the GitHub. To make you know, maybe the, make, it's a good idea to create an assembly language program for the TS Pico. Right. We can also introduce more examples or more detail about the the, the BIOS inside the the XROM. Yeah. Well, it sounds I, like I, I, Jer yeah. yeah, it sounds like Jeremiah could use uh, could use that for this a little. You know, in addition to learning assembly, he could probably be rolling that in at the same yeah. time just so he can get his feet wet. Uh, you know, saving and loading stuff to the to the SD card. And Mark. Yes, so, sometimes I use those uh, BIOS in order to to see what the response uh, received from the TS Pico firmware, mm -hmm. because when Ricardo developed the, the the module in Python, I need to communicate with the with the CPU there. Okay, and I use the the, the assembly routines to check the connectivity and and the command response. Uh, we have a very hard protocol because uh, we have a CRC between the message. We have a very, very robust protocol to, to support in the communication. Uh, yeah. Speaking of the Pico, uh, you know, in addition to getting 3D printed cases, right, for the ZX80 that I've ordered, I actually ordered two of the Pico 3D cases too, because I know I have mine. Which now that I'm thinking about it, I need to get that fixed. Because I know David had mentioned, you know, looks like looks like my Pico just is, is has nothing on it. Yep. Uh, so I need I need to load the firmware on there. But anyway, because it doesn't blink lights or anything, not like Adams, because we had them both. That right was there. left as an exercise to the user. Well, yeah, that's what I figured. You're just like, well, Carl's going to get it. We'll just let him load it from scratch. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Which is fine, you know. I yeah, it's not my first rodeo with those things. But anyway, um, uh, the other thing, yeah. So I got I got the three D printed cases for that. So I, I got two of them. Just probably one for Adam. I don't think you have one, Ryan. Right? I I know Adam has one. Um, I don't I have don't a think case. Ryan, no. Well, no, I know you don't have the case. That's why I got oh, an extra oh, I one. Uh, so you'll be able to put it into a case. 
Cool. Um, plus, I like how they did the case. You know, whoever did that model, yeah. um, I may need to talk to them because, uh, you know, I don't know how to do that in, in whatever software, probably Fusion 360 they probably did it in or whatever. That seems to be a popular choice. But, you know, if we could make that bigger, you know, I'm thinking maybe it's something on a 2060 uh, bus expansion unit kind of size, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. with a similar... 2060. Uh, Sheremia, can I ask you a question? Hello? Yeah, I think, there you go. Yeah, oh, yeah okay. sure, my computer is kind of... Uh... Okay. No, my question is, what uh, assembly language or what tool are they using to to program in the games or or programs oh, from um, the twenty sixty eight? Right now, I'm uh, I'm just using uh, uh, Pathmo. Mm. Uh, okay. Hot Z, come on, <laughs> say it with it's me. It's not Hot an Z. assembler. <laughs> sure, it is. That's how I wrote but, my cartridge program for the but, diagnostics. But, but C is for Spectrum, not for Timex. No, it's for the Timex because that was made made by Ray Kingsley, right? Well, yeah, yeah. Hansi is an American product. On. Yeah, he just lives up the road in Santa Fe. Well, he did. I, I don't think he's with us anymore, but ah, ah, hot C. Okay, no, I, I, I yeah, hot C. C, C, C programming language. No, okay. No, 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 no. That's right. Yeah. Okay, but Hot Z will. Um, well, that's what I used, you know, back in the day, Jeremiah, for my yeah. stuff. But um, and you know, there's tons of documentation. Plus, you can get it on cartridge. You can get, you know, there's all kinds of versions of it that uh, you know will make it easy to run on the 2068. Okay, hey. and the next question is: Are you using the the sound chip for the 2068, or are you using the standard? ear port for spectrum i'm planning to use the the sound chip i haven't implemented any sound in my little program yet except for like a testing that plays one or two notes but uh i'm planning to use the ay chip oh perfect okay high quality games <laughs> <laughs> oh wow welcome <laughs> <laughs> yeah um, he needs anything better than a beeper anyway. That's all I need to know. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. I want to use a couple minutes. Mike uh, asked a question in the in the chat about a thing that was that came out for the um, the one thousand in in theory. Uh, so in in Sync Magazine in volume in uh, number four of the third year, uh, a guy named Dan Roy wrote an article. <clears throat> titled so you wished you had bought a ts2000 and that really wasn't the basic premise of the article what it was is that dan had uh attached a texas instruments tms 9918 to his 1000 and then also added some other stuff he added some sound uh features and a joystick port and it was actually uh quite a big uh, board. <clears throat> Let me just share my screen here. I can share the article. Um, unfortunately, it's in black and white, of course, because, you know, it's an article. Uh, so I'm going to zoom ahead here to, there we go. There's the board layout. So let me make that bigger. That's a pretty long article. That's a pretty long article. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, so the over here on the left hand side is where you would plug <laughs> you plug your your you know 81 slash 1000 into this thing because it's so big you know you're not plugging it into your computer um and then there's some expansion slots that he's designed here you know it's, it's got like the rf like RF like RF expansion unit for the 1000 <laughs> basically yeah yeah um and so I, I had actually talked to Dan and there's a, you know, a schematic here. Uh, I found Dan, he lives up in New Hampshire or something like that. Oh yeah. He, he did analog joysticks, the, like the Radio Shack color computer. Um, mm -hmm. I talked to him about this and what was kind of amusing is that he's not an engineer. He's not a circuit designer. You know, his job was writing software 
uh, and doing doing stuff for some some company. Um, but he got a hold of you know he had these these colleagues that did hardware stuff and he'd go down to the shop every once in a while and say okay i want to do this thing and they would you know walk him through that little part and eventually he ended up with this this whole big board right um and you, you see the date it says july august of 83 uh <clears throat> there was a company in um in new jersey called comp usa not the not the store uh and one of the products that they brought out was a floppy disk system for the 1000 it's actually they actually imported one from from the uk uh and they um had worked through at least a contract and enough of that so that this this thing that dan had done appeared in ads uh, uh CompUSA ads as the colors in 81 c o l o r s i n 81 um but then of course you know the market ended and uh that thing didn't come out um <clears throat> so anyway mike mike asked but and i've talked to dan i've asked dan you know to come join us and tell us the story because it's just to me it's fascinating you know this this guy is he just wanted some you know some color output on his 1000. <laughs> he just wanted to learn, learn a little bit about circuit design. He built this massive thing, right? He could have just bought Chrome 80 and been happy. Or Chrome he should have, <laughs> right. Yes, he should have just gone forward in time. Yeah, um, I noticed the 16K RAM chips on there too. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Uh, and so this, uh, this is a good segue into, I have reached out to David All and... For those of you who remember names like that, David is the person that published Sync Magazine. And before that, he started Creative Computing. And if you were a kid, you know, in the late 70s, in the early 80s, who got a book full of computer games for basic, it was that book that he put out, the... Um, I think it's got basic 101 basic games. There are three of them. Computers or something like that. No. The first one. Yeah. Yeah. All three of them. Yeah. But the, the very first one's the one that, you know, everybody knows about. Yeah. Um, yeah. David, David got his start um, at digital equipment in their education uh, area. And that's what led him down this, this publishing path. <clears throat> I reached out to David um, just before he went off to a, um, a mission. I don't know if he said, I think he said Africa. Um, and he, he came back and so we're still trying to sort out, uh, you know, when he can join us, he's 84. So he's going to be on the show. I'm hoping so. He's 84. Whoa. He said he just had a heart attack. He spent a couple of weeks in the hospital. And so, you know, I figure we got to give him a little time to recover. Um, but the other thing that David did was he says, uh, you know, I've got, I've got every issue of, of course. He has every full run of sync and mm -hmm. and and all of the uh the books that got published that he that his company published for the um you know for the 81 and the 1000 one of those books was uh a, a, a 1000 specific edition of katie and the microcomputer or something like that and it's a book aimed at kids i've only ever seen it for the you know the, the trash 80 or whatever but he he said you know I got all this stuff and you know if you want it let me know and so i said yes and i sent him the appropriate amount of of monetary units um <clears throat> so i don't personally need a full run of sync um uh so you know I assume they've all been archived already they right? have been yep okay mm -hmm. yep and i have backup copies for you know some of the archive copies aren't great so I'll, i didn't do those scans but I'll, I'll go back and you know do do some rescanning for those bad oh, ones but um you know, I'll put a I'll put a message out on the list for if somebody wants a full run of sync, it's nice and it's got the the special. It was this like special edition that was just like an advertisement for the magazine itself. It was a magazine that was an advertisement for the magazine. Um, and then there's a couple other books that are um, some of them some of them have been archived, some have not, um, and I'll be doing those. And also, David. Solly, who was with us earlier today, he sent me this, which has not been archived yet. 
that I think it has because I have that book. The science and I, engineering I think, programs for the one thousand. Yeah, I think Carl archived it. Oh God! All right, I think I don't even know what I've done or what what's on my site anymore. <laughs> oh my God! All right. I, yeah, certainly I have the book, and I think I think Carl archived it. Let's look here. Science. <laughs> well, while you're looking that up, David, I, just, I know we're running out of time. Nope. I just wanted to give you guys a plug. Uh, I haven't watched it yet, but I know uh, uh, what's his name, uh, the, the real animated YouTube guy. I guess you sent him a video board, <laughs> right? Your TSP, yes, TJ. Mm -hmm. uh, I did see that he reviewed it. I haven't watched it yet, but uh, you know, you had mentioned it last meeting. Yeah, uh, you and Jeff that uh, you you roped Jeff into making that, and uh, I need to watch that because it sounds like it would be interesting product to have. Uh, but, um, yeah, I just wanted to, you know, shout out to you guys for, you know, I don't know how many of you other folks knew that TJ had a, you know, article or a YouTube video up about that board. Yeah. Yeah. If you're not, you know what, let me just get that, that real quick from TJ's, uh, <clears throat> um, yeah, so Plus he has the Pico. Yeah. He, he reviewed the Pico too. I exactly. Guess that's, he's your, so, he's your uh, media outlet guy. <laughs> uh, don't, don't tell him. <laughs> um well you yeah. know he does have a pretty big youtube following so i mean that that totally makes sense right he's yeah and and terribly animated like you said you know very yes. very uh <laughs> excited about stuff and um i'm gonna just drop that in the chat for folks um uh, troll v yes okay um <clears throat> It's wonderful, and uh, right, and he does that. He did that one video about the Pico, and he also talks about the Pico and about some of his, you know, kind of challenges in grasping how it works, which is totally understandable. Um, you know, we're we're working on making it less challenging for some folks. Yeah, it actually came up to this evening, or, or this evening that I saw in a post that uh, someone made yeah. about trying to make the the syntax a little easier. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, a bunch bunch of folks have has have, have put some really uh, excellent ideas on the groups.io list um, about you know potential ways to make it you know easier to use, um, and we have um, we have we have a, a laundry list. <laughs> right. Well, just to throw another thing onto that, it's not in the forums, but maybe somebody pointed it out, but. Uh, I think Adam can attest to when I brought the V drives over, you know, we were doing the micro drives on the uh, yeah. spectrum. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's a toolkit that you can load, right. That goes with that. And it simplifies, I mean, like cataloging and formatting and it's just the format of tape is just F F that's it. Format is it, tape, is it a tape program that runs like a, like a menu based program or something like that? No, it's, it's, it's kind of sits in the background. It's just, you know, so it's not like a, in the foreground but you yeah. know when you hit f this toolkit intercepts that somehow right it knows f and that you're doing these huh. things because when you start the computer up it's not in there yeah. you actually have to hit run right you the first command you do on the spectrum is run enter and it loads that toolkit into oh. ram i guess right and now it's active and you can oh. turn it on and off right you can you know disable it or enable it but it has a help file and i know adam was much more well, even for me, it's much easier to use those sure. abbreviated commands yeah. than than unless you're Ryan, which he apparently <laughs> knows the old microdrive commands by heart because you know we didn't have the toolkit loaded. Because like, Ryan is well, the we... <laughs> But he was telling us, yeah, oh yeah, you got to do a save, you know, asterisk, comma, m, comma, you know, and I'm like, oh my yeah, god, for the yeah, yeah, it is pretty, it have is to... pretty uh, obtuse, yeah. Good point. Right. So that's what that's what uh, Charlie did. You know, I don't know if he did that or if he had somebody do that for him. Oh, yes. Charlie. Okay. You know, Charlie Ingley. Yes. 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 I bet yeah, it's him. Right. I bet so it's you, not a micro drive thing. Right. Okay. So it might be something you might want to talk to him about and yep. see how you know maybe you can incorporate that into the Pico where you know it has a help file right mm -hmm. and it intercepts things right off of the command line you know right off of the syntax line so well, that you don't have to and one of the really nice things about the pico is that in the flash there's uh eight ish um spaces for um you know for roms or for doc files uh the, the this the sram works the same way you know it can be doc doc space but uh especially with the flash is you know one could write a program 
um, you know, in basic and just like you with, a, just like with a cartridge, you can put a basic program on a cartridge. It could go into that, into that flash space and become a permanent thing that you can just sort of, I don't mm -hmm. know, through some magic, magic keystroke uh, incantation get to easily. Yeah. Good point. Good point. Carl. Uh, yeah. I just, I just found that really convenient uh, in that application. I can see mm -hmm. where that would, that would benefit the Pico as well as yeah. TS Pico. Yeah. Cause like I said, you could save just using S and then whatever microdrive catalog, you know, all these things are just easy, easy one letter commands. You yeah. Know? Cool. Uh, on that uh, note. Oh, sorry. Was somebody going to say something? Uh, I was just the question. I, I don't know if we had covered with Pico was, um, was why the interface was the way it was versus how some of the drives, uh, the drive systems would use the syntax error method with a special character. Mm -hmm. I think we did, and I've forgotten what that, uh, why that was. Yeah. Um, because it's just a rewritten ROM versus swapping. Maybe in we can talk about that next time because we're running it over quite a yeah, bit. Yeah, reason. Yeah, let's 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 do that as a topic for our next meeting, which is coincidentally um, Sunday, March seventeenth, two p.m. Eastern. Uh, <clears throat> and by the way, that is St. Patrick's Day, and if you don't wear green for the meeting. You will just be booted automatically. <laughs> Does my background work? Your background counts. <laughs> I bet you. Uh, Jeff, I bet you. Jeff's got some uh, green flannel. And and everybody's Jeff. Do you have green flannel? <laughs> I said I okay, bet good. you. Jeff's got some green flannel. Yeah. Good. good. And and uh, everybody will have to drink a green beverage. It doesn't have to be beer, but it has to be a green beverage. McDonald's brought back their Shamrock Shake, so that counts. Those things ah. are so gross. Oh, <laughs> I mean, if, if you can stomach it. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, but let's let's talk about uh, you know why the Pico is the way it is in terms of you know how you interact with it and you know why it's different from other uh, other systems and <clears throat> you know some of the stuff that's that's underway to uh, you know improve the Pico and we can we can spend some time on that. Absolutely. Thanks, David. Yeah. And I just wanted to shout out to everybody that's, uh, you know, the 1510 clone project. You know, I appreciate all the support and effort on that. So, you know, you'll be getting more out there soon. So uh, I hope you guys enjoy it. Carl, well, I, I know love you, it. I know you I, enjoy it. <laughs> I love that you're doing that, man. That's awesome. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you, gentlemen. Yeah. Thank you. Have a good evening. Bye, guys. Thank you. Bye. See you.